Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Bailey Coert. I am the Vice President for Institutional Enrollment, and we are grateful to have you joining in this evening for our first of three webinar series for our, um, our parents as your roos join us here on campus in a few short weeks. We um, have a great presentation tonight for the student athlete. Uh, at this time, your cameras are off as well as your microphone. You are welcome to send in any questions through the Q&A response. Um, and we will respond to all questions at the end of the presentation. We are recording this event, so um, you can go back and watch it or share with others who weren't able to be on uh, the webinar this evening. At this time, I will turn it over to David Norman, who will um, walk you through what to expect as your athlete arrives to campus soon. David? Good evening, everybody. And, and uh, first of all, welcome to Austin College, and then also welcome to the Austin College Athletics family. As Bailey said, um, I am the Director of Athletics, and to be very honest with you, I'm the least most important person in our entire, in our entire department. Obviously, we think very highly and important people are our coaches, our support staff, our trainers, our sports information. Every, all these people make our program and make our department special. But without a doubt, the most important and top priority for us is our student athletes. So I just want to welcome you. I'm going to just kind of, you know, share some information. Uh, obviously, Bailey has... Uh, has, has provided an opportunity to tell everyone how to submit questions. And at the end of this, I'll answer those as much as we can. There's really no way that, that we can prepare you or, uh, and, and cover every topic, but we do take a lot of pride at Austin College, not just in athletics, that if you have a question, feel free to call us and we will get you the answer as soon as we can. Obviously, we may be dealing with two types of parents tonight. First of all, we have the parent that this is their second, third, or fourth child that's gone to college. So they've been through this before. And then we have those of you who are sending your first child to college. Now, when I visit with your student athletes and, and compliance meetings, I will not refer to them as a child. But I do want you to know as a father, as a grandfather, uh, our children will always be our special cargo. So I know that it's a very exciting time for you. Uh, you will be turning your precious cargo over to us, not just the athletic department, but Austin College as a whole in a, in a few weeks. And we look forward to that. And we hope that you look forward to that as well. First of all, I just wanna tell you, where can you find almost anything you need to find and probably get the majority of your questions answered that, and, and I'm talking about athletics specifically, we would encourage you to become familiar with our Austin College Athletics website. Our, uh, our domain is acruse.com, or you could go to the Austin College website and just click on athletics, and it will take you straight to that program. We try to keep that up to date as much as we can. We have 15 sports, we have 400 student athletes, we have one person that manages our website, but it is a good place to not only find out about what's upcoming, not you know to understand your schedules and things like that, but if you take time to look at the inside athletics tab, you will see several drop downs that could be important to you. Number one is our directory. Our directory we are still in the process of updating that because we are still making new hires as we speak. So that will be updated no later than the middle of next week, but it will contain email addresses and office phone numbers for everyone in our department. That includes our administrative assistant, of course, myself and all of our support staff. So that's a good place to start. The other thing, if you wanna know what our specific policies and procedures are, the, one of the drop downs is the student athlete handbook. That student athlete handbook really covers everything that we will review with your son or daughter 
and the required NCAA compliance meetings. A couple of things that I, I do want, and, and, and we also on the website, we, we keep up with team pages, all of that. So you might wanna find yourself, familiarize yourself with that, and, and, and that will be a good place to start when you're just looking for information. That is also where we, uh, we, we manage uh, any announcements that come up, our up-to-date news, and how it really impacts parents is when we have schedule changes, or more importantly, when we're dealing with possible rainouts, reschedule, cancellations, and things like that. Fortunately, we don't have a lot of them, but as you know, the last couple of years have been uh, very interesting with, with weather patterns. They've been very interesting uh, with our COVID situation where, I mean, just two years ago, we weren't even playing in the fall. So we are happy to get back on schedule and everything moving forward. You know, we are a member of the NCAA Division Three. We also are a member of the Southern Collegi Collegiate Athletic Conference with all of our sports, with the exception of football, which is a member of the American Southwest Conference. Men and women's water polo, women's water polo is the Collegiate uh, Water Polo Association. Men's water polo is the Mountain Pacific Sports Federation. Why do I share that with you? Because eligibility compliance out of those three areas, they actually supersede the, the college's policies and procedures when it deals with compliance and eligibility. So yes, to participate in the NCAA, our student athletes are required to provide a little bit more information, to sign a lot more forms, and to do some things that just the everyday student who's not involved in athletics doesn't have to do. So we will be meeting with your sons and daughters in our compliance meetings. And just so you will know, our NCAA compliance meetings last two days. And we go over everything. Your son and daughter is an adult now. And, and, and it's going to be a lot of information for them to process. Obviously, you, I mean, I'm 61 years old. I can't remember anything after about 15 minutes. But we are here to support them. And if they have any questions, we're here to clarify anything that they have. As you know, we've got report dates coming up. We basically classify all of our programs either as a fall sport, a winter sport, or a spring sport. Our fall sports are the sports that begin before September, including football, volleyball, men's water polo, men and women's soccer, and our cheer program. Each one of them, if you have a son or daughter that's participating in them, they have received information about when they report to camp, those type of things, we will be, our coaches will be putting that information out again, just to remind them. But just so you'll know, remember our football team, you report to campus on Tuesday, August the 9th. The first thing you will do is you'll move in to your assigned dorm from 10 until noon. Not a lot of time. Going to have some people over there to help you, those type of things. Our student life uh, office takes care of all of the move in. Once you move in, I do need to tell you, you will at 1.30, our NCAA compliance meetings begin, and they will go until about nine o'clock that night, and then when we wake them up the next day, we will do it all over again. So as a parent, if you're dropping your son off for football, move them into the dorm. We're going to give you a chance if y'all want to go off campus and grab something to eat, but after that, you just have to hug them turn them over to us, and, the, and, and, and we will take care of them. We promise. The first practice for football is that following Tuesday. So I guess that would be 9th, 10th, will be, uh, be on Thursday the 12th. Our men and women's soccer program, our volleyball program, our men's water polo program, and our cheer, you will move into your dorms on Sunday, August the 14th. Move in again is 3 to 5 p.m., and then our NCAA compliance starts at 7 p.m. And it will go all the way until probably 9 or 10 that evening. And then the next day, we will complete that. It will be a day-long process. 
and their first practices will begin August the 16th. For all of our other sports, our basketball programs, our swimming programs, tennis, softball, baseball, women's water polo, you do not need to worry about any early arrival. You should just report to school when you're supposed to with all the other students. But one thing that we will, we will be sharing with them if we haven't done that, on Saturday, August the 27th, we will have all of those student athletes will need to be on campus and we will do their NCAA compliance uh, procedure during that day. So we will be communicating with all of our, our spring sports and winter sports and forming them to mark off August the 27th. So I know that a lot of you, that'll be the first Saturday after classes start. So you're hoping you can, you know, y'all come home or, or whatever, or we're gonna drive up to Sherman and take you out to eat lunch. We, we could do that but just know that they're gonna be involved from about eight o'clock in the morning until five o'clock that afternoon. So that takes care of just the compliance issues that we are going to go over. Uh, and and, uh, and, 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 and I, I kind of wanna give you an oversight, excuse me, stammering around and talk a little bit about the NCAA eligibility. We will have approximately 27 forms that each student athlete will have to fill out. A lot of those are mundane. We go over each one of those forms, not sentence by sentence, but we cover the important parts because you know how it is in today's world. A lot of people just like to sign things and sign off on it, but we want to make sure that your student athletes understand exactly what is expected of them as a participant in the NCAA and their respective conference, and more importantly, in our athletic uh, program. Some of the things that we will talk about, and it's important for you to know, is we will talk about academic eligibility. As you know, our number one priority, we love playing, we love competing, all of that. But at the end of the day, our number one priority is the academic success of all of our student athletes. And I'm proud to report that of our approximately 400 student athletes, our overall GPA as a department is above a 3.0. And that says quite a bit when you take into consideration that that means half is above and maybe a few are below. So we're excited. We support our student athletes. We actually, just so you will know, we have a full-time coordinator of academic success for our student athletes. We work closely with our faculty they provide us with information if, if, if student athletes are not going to class or even struggling, we become aware of that and then we turn them over to our coordinator of academic success who meets with them and we make sure that we get them directed to all the resources that they need. And they'll be able to tell you a little bit more about that, but there will be some mandatory things that we make all first year student athletes participate in. An example of that would be a mandatory workshop on how to talk to a professor. Another mandatory workshop on time management. You have to understand that when your student athletes report, they will be given the plan for the semester, when practices are, the days we're going to depart, those type of things. So time management for our student athletes is very important. And I want to clarify, time management for first-year college students is very important because they're not going to have mom and dad there to wake them up. They're going to have a different academic schedule. You know, they're used to going to school, get there at 8.30, leave at 3.30, those type of things. We know all of their class schedules are different. Some of them may not be in class until 1.30 in the afternoon. Some may be in class at 8 a.m., some of them uh, may not have any classes on Tuesday, Thursday, all of their classes on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So it's important that we work with them to make sure that they understand the importance of time management. And then we also do some other things with them. We talk to them about the importance of, of, get, of taking care of themselves, of making sure that they are having proper habits when we can't see them. Understand you're not going to be around your son or daughter 24 7 and neither are we. So we will address those situations, provide them with resources, 
more importantly, they should all feel comfortable with going to their coach or coming to me, even if they need to, if they have any issues, and we will reach out to them as well. You're entering a new phase. Uh, your, your son or daughter is, is now an adult. There are a couple of forms that you need to be aware of, and you'll hear more about this, but the NCAA has a different and, and, and kind of has, not kind of, the NCAA has higher expectations in a couple of different areas that we don't require for a student that's not in, in athletics. Number one, the consent and the consent and the approval to allow your son or daughter to be drug tested. It's a requirement by the NCAA that every student athlete will allow a, a drug test if they are asked to do so. I want to clarify to you that at Austin College, we do not drug test our student athletes, but we do reserve the right to drug test our student athletes if we need to, or we feel like there's a reason for us to do that. We will communicate that clearly to the student athlete because they are going to be protected by the educational privacy and the health privacy that they deserve. So we will not contact parents. Okay, we're gonna drug test your, your son or daughter, none of those things. So, but, but it is important that they agree to be drug tested because if we are fortunate to go into postseason play, which in the last few years, we've had several programs do that. Well, a part of being in the postseason play is that the NCAA can drug test a student athlete at any time. The other thing that we need you to be aware of is, is that our student athletes will sign a FERPA release, FERPA, the Federal Education Rights Privacy Act. You may or may not know, but the educational information of your son and daughter is protected for them. We, if you were to call me or your professor or anything like that and say, hey, I think my son's uh, or my daughter's struggling in class, can you tell me how they're doing in class and those things? Those are all things that are protected uh, by federal law for our son and daughter and we, for your son and daughter. And we cannot share that, not even with the parent without their permission. But the one FERPA release that they do in the NCAA is they allow us to share their academic information, their class schedules, how many hours that they are enrolled in. We, that is all protected information. It does not go outside of the NCAA, but we do have to provide that to confirm their eligibility. So just so you will know, we, we, we protect the privacy of all of our student athletes. You will never see a release from the Austin College Athletics Department that says Tommy or Billy or Susie has been uh, you know, suspended for the team or Tommy, silly, Billy or Susie won't be playing this week because they're injured because we just will not share that information. So I wanted you to know that if your son or daughter, and we'll go, we'll go through this with them, they will understand the HIPAA and the FERPA release and how it relates to them, but it is not for public knowledge. Another thing that I wanna tell you that's a little bit different, your son and daughter is involved in a college athletic program. Uh, we will treat them fairly, but you need to understand not, not everyone plays. Not everyone travels. You can only play, let's say, football, for instance, 11 at a time. I only share that with you is because as parents and our contacts, I want to go into communication with coaches and the athletic director. If there's this general information you need, like when the game time starts or, or things like that, we will gladly answer those. We also want you to feel free to contact one of us if you feel like the safety and welfare of your son and daughter is that is in jeopardy or needs to be addressed or we need to be aware of that. The one thing we will not entertain though, is we will not entertain a call from a parent that just wants to talk to a coach or an athletic director about why your son or your daughter isn't playing. They are adults, we will communicate that with them. So 
Uh, I, I know that we haven't had a lot of instances of that. But there have been a few in my last 34 years at Austin College. I've been here for 34 years where a parent will say, I want to talk to you because my son or daughter isn't playing. And I just say, we will not have that conversation. We will discuss that with your son or daughter. And again, I can count on one hand in 35 years that that's happened. But it's always good to understand that we will treat your son and daughter as an adult. We will care for them. We will be on the lookout. If they need help with anything, we will try to get them uh, to the right place. We will do everything in our effort to do that. One of the things that we will and that your son or daughter will sign off on and they will understand, it's called academic accountability. For instance, we when we travel, we have a set travel squad that is accepted, that, that is, that is uh, accepted by our conferences, so those are set. When we travel, we put out our travel squad 48 hours prior to departure. It is the responsibility of the student athlete to communicate that to their professors. Athletics at Austin College is a recognized co-curricular activity. When we have absences because of travel, those are excused. Only if the student athlete has communicated that to the professor. And we talk to our student athletes, we will tell them the first day of class, you should go to your professor, tell them you're a member of your respective team, tell them you will have information of when you're going to, when you could possibly be missing class, because we want professors to support our student athletes. And I can tell you that our faculty at Austin College is very supportive of our student athletes and what we are doing. However, if they feel like an absence will be detrimental to their academic performance, they do have the, the scope to not allow that student athlete to travel. In other words, if that student athlete is in danger of failing a class and they think missing that class could be detrimental, then they can say, we're not going to let them go. Now, at the end of the day, I'm just going to shoot you straight. In 33 years, we've had that happen four times, okay? So it's not like it happens every year. And in all four of those instances, it came down to one thing. The student athlete wasn't going to class. But as, you, as I've shared with you, we have mechanisms in place where we communicate with our faculty on a weekly basis. We communicate with our coordinator of academic success. We communicate with academic skills. We do all of those things, so we pretty much catch that before it becomes an issue. Another thing is our travel in our travel policy that, that everyone needs to understand, especially parents. When our team, regardless of their age, when you leave with a team, that is their number one priority. Everything, we are responsible for all of our student athletes for the duration of the trip. So our coaches will share more information but if you're going to expect to see your son or daughter when the trip is going on or maybe have them come home with you or maybe maybe they come to us and say, hey, I, I, I want to stay uh, in San Antonio after the game. I'm an adult. I can do that. Understand that we will not allow them to do that. There are some special situations that come up. Maybe there's a special event that they need to be home at. Maybe it's, a, I don't know, a wedding or, or, or maybe another issue where they just need to be there. If that's the case, we will only release that student athlete to a parent or a legal guardian. We have different policies at Austin College in athletics. I want to review one of them and let's just jump straight to it. Number one, drugs and alcohol. Everything that we do Austin, at Austin College supports the college's drug and alcohol policy. So when we become aware of a violation for drugs and alcohol, we report that to the institution and then we follow that procedure and that policy in place. It's important to know that the only alcohol policy in written form that we have in the athletic department is that when you travel, Regardless of your age, there's absolutely no alcohol. So 
In other words, if, if, a, if a student athlete thinks just because they're 21, they can have alcohol when they're in their room, that we do not do that. However, it's important to note that our teams do have their own individual alcohol policies, and that changes from sport to sport. Student athletes will be well aware of what those policies are and what the consequences are if those policies are violated. Again, I share that with you, but I don't want anyone to think that we have a drug issue, we have an alcohol issue, those types of things. Now, one of the things, some of you uh, may be aware of this, it's new for the NCAA, the, uh, all divisions this year. When your son or daughter meets in their compliance forms, they will have to sign a student athlete misconduct attestation form. It is required for them to participate. And on that form, they have to attest that they have not been found responsible for violating a high school, college, or university policy, or been subject to discipline through a Title IX or sexual misconduct proceeding, and that they did not leave any prior institution with conduct charges pending. They just have to attest that they have or have not. If they have not, they will attest to that, but then all student athletes will be required to give Austin College and our Title IX information the, the, the uh, I will just, they will allow Austin College to the oversight of the Title IX office and assistance from the athletic director where applicable to contact any prior institutions to gather any additional information regarding the disclosure. So they will be waiving their FERPA rights to allow us, if we have to, to contact prior institutions, which includes high schools or if they're a transfer student, if they have uh, attested that they do have pending out there. Please know that when we are faced with a Title IX situation with our department, we automatically report that to our HR and Title IX office. This is a state law. So if a, if a student athlete comes to a coach or comes to one of us with information about possible sexual misconduct, we make it clear to them to know that we will report that to the Title IX office. Please know that the Title IX office, all information that we share is confidential. We cannot share that with anyone except with the specific person that we are dealing with. So that is new for the NCAA. It is new, all current students, all new students, all transfers will have to sign that attestation. And we will do that if they have not done so, if, they, if they've received it from the Title IX office, they need to sign that and bring that with them when they check in. And then if they don't have one, we will have one there at their compliance meetings. I, I wanna briefly talk to you a little bit about sportsmanship. <laughs> Man, it, it's just uh, gotten crazy, but your son or daughter as a student athlete, this is conference requirements. They will sign a form to attest that they will be good sports, not only when they play. So if they're playing in a contest and they're ejected, we will follow NCAA and conference protocol. But it goes beyond that. If your son or daughter is removed as a spectator at another one of our games, we report that to the, the conference office. And there could be ramifications that impact their eligibility. At the end of the day, we love to be loud. We love to be proud. And that's our motto. Be loud. Be proud. Be positive. So as you come to contest, understand we'll have a game day administrator there. And if we catch anyone, players, parents, fans, opposing fans that make any derogatory comments towards coaches, players, or officials, you will be removed from the contest. Again, we don't have that, but 
let's be good sports. Uh, let, let we, we know how to be good sports. And we expect our student athletes to model good sportsmanship. And we expect our spectators and our parents to do the same. Uh, so we go into that a lot with them. I wanna talk a little bit about health and safety. When your son or daughter reports, they should bring with them a copy of their physical. Each one of them on all of our websites have been given the link to the physical form that they have to use to participate in athletics. That physical form is different than the physical form of students attending Austin College that aren't participating in athletics. So we have a specific form that they have to fill out and we have to have it on that form. So if your son or daughter has not gotten their physical yet, make sure you use the appropriate form. Make sure that you just don't use a form from your doctor's office or the form that's required for their uh, enrollment at Austin College as a first year student. Understand that the athletics physical form that will meet the requirement for what student life and admissions is asking you to provide in terms of safety and, and pre-enrollment uh, forms. So I hope that that is clear. You can find a copy of our pre-participation form by going on our athletics website. Go to Inside Athletics, drop down to Athletic Training, and it will take you to our page and you will see a link that says pre participation physical forms. We do have a team physician. Our team physician also serves as our health care administrator for athletics. This is a required position by all NCAA programs. The health care administrator is the last say and the ultimate authority on every decision that involves the safety and welfare of a student athlete. That also includes if for some reason your son or daughter has an injury and they are cleared by their individual doctor, our healthcare administrator reserves the right to find out more about that and, and, and they make the final decision on return to play. We do have a certified concussion impact physician that is soon, both of our athletic trainers are impact certified. As soon as they have one diagnosis or one symptom of a possible concussion, we turn them over to our impact certified physician. And then we begin a return to play protocol with them. We take concussions, we take injuries, very uh, serious is kind of a different word when we're talking about injuries, but we take those and they have our utmost priority. The safety and welfare. Safety and welfare, when I talk about welfare, I'm not just talking about their physical safety, I'm talking about their mental safety, all of those. Those are our top priorities. We have great resources on campus and we direct our student athletes and we use those resources to help us make sure that we have a return to play and a return to normal activity, regardless of what the issue is. I wanna talk a little bit about our team physician. Our team physician is Dr. John Prudich. He is an orthopedic physician out of McKinney, P-R-U-D-I-C-H. As you know, we will have athletic trainers that are available and that are, in, that, that are around all practices and all games. If your son or daughter is dealing with an injury, they will first be evaluated by our athletic trainer, and then they will be evaluated by our team doctor if we need them to do that. But let's say we have a, an injury that requires surgery. At that point in time, we will communicate with the student athlete who will communicate with you. You do not have to use our team physician. Let's say if there's an ACL injury that, I mean, ACL surgery that needs to be done or anything like that. So you can use your private physician anytime you want to. But you need to understand that if you choose to use a different physician other than ours, then our physician cannot evaluate the progress of their return to play. Your student athlete 
our trainers will communicate with your physician that you choose. Our athletic trainers will do everything that we can here in-house for the rehabilitation and return to play of all injuries. So we will make that clear, but if there's a situation, they may be evaluated first by our team physician. He may say, you know what, you've got a torn ACL. It's gonna require surgery. Well, then we turn that over to the student athlete who will communicate with you and you can decide which route that you wanna go, but you are not required to use our team physician for surgeries and things like that. But we will involve you in that because for most cases, you know, you still have a responsibility when we get into insurance and, and things like that. So let's talk about insurance. You may or may not know, but our student athletes know, every student athlete at Austin College must provide their own personal insurance and they are responsible, responsible for confirming that that insurance covers participation in intercollegiate athletics. One of the things that your student athlete are gonna to have to bring with them when they come to the compliance meetings is a copy of their insurance card. They can take a picture of it, but we will need the front and the back of that card because they will download that onto our sportswear forms. So we need to have current information the student athlete is responsible for confirming that it does cover participation in, in athletics. So, you know, you need to make sure if you're responsible for your son or daughter's insurance, you may want to make sure that you can confirm that it does cover participation in intercollegiate athletics. If it does not, then we encourage student athletes to look into our school insurance that they provide for every student for every student. It's called Wellfleet. If you know that your son or daughter is going to use the school insurance, we also use Wellfleet in athletics. And Wellfleet, the school insurance, does cover participation in NCAA athletics. I do want to share with you that we do have a supplemental insurance policy that is in effect for all of our student athletes that sustain an injury that requires uh, physician support. We have a deductible of $2,500. So what does that mean? Once the parent or the student athlete has fulfilled $2,500, either through their personal insurance or out of their pocket, then it turns over and falls underneath our student athlete supplemental insurance. So in short, we take over after $2,500 has been met. As you know, some of you have been through this when you're talking about surgery, when you're talking about those types of things, uh, $2,500 doesn't go a long way. But we have an insurance policy that will kick in and cover those expenses once they exceed $2,500. We will be meeting with the student athletes. That's one thing we'll do in those two days. They will understand who the company is, how we file claims, and those type of things. So even though you are responsible for individual insurance that covers intercollegiate athletics, you can rest, I, I guess, a little bit easier to know that once it exceeds the $2,500 mark, either out of your pocket or out of your individual insurance's pocket, it then rolls over into our supplemental uh, insurance. And we will communicate with your son or daughter about that component. Uh, I want to talk a little bit uh, about uh, our new student orientation. As you know, whether you're a fall sport that's coming in early or you're a winter sport or a spring sport, that begins on Friday, August the 19th. So those of you that aren't fall sport athletes, you'll be moving your son or daughter or they'll be coming up here on those dates. However, for our fall sports, you need to understand that the orientation that will take place on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday will take priority over athletic practices. We do our best to have athletic practices that don't interfere with the required mandatory things that the first-year students have to go to. 
but it's just it's it's something that we do. We will make sure your student athletes understand that if we have a practice scheduled during that time, they must go to their required orientation activities. If we learn that they do not go to those activities, then they will automatically be ineligible for the first contest. We will work with on that. But if your son or daughter calls you and you're not here for orientation, you know, I think that we're doing a parent thing, but then we're kicking all the parents off campus. You know, we, we need to get the parents out of there and we take over and we start allowing your son or daughter to be a college student. But if we find out that they skip anything, well, then we will handle that internally and it could impact. But if your son or daughter says, hey, you know, I've got this orientation stuff. I think I'm not going to go to it because it's not important. They will know what is required. There are some optional things, but a lot of those are required. And we do take enrollment. I mean, we do take attendance at those things. So just know that support your student athletes with that orientation procedure. It won't impact their eligibility. It won't impact their status on the team. And we'll be rocking and rolling. Uh, classes, as you know, start Tuesday, August the 23rd. Once classes begin, okay, once classes begin, we have a dedicated athletic time from 4.30 to 7 p.m. each day. That is when we will have our practices. However, if you are in a sport that has a shared facility, water polo, swimming, basketball, volleyball, there are times that we do practice outside of that time but it will never be, it will never interfere with an academic class time. So if, if students are in class until 4.20, we will not start a practice until 4.30 to give them time to do that. If we have to practice outside of that hour, it will typically be in the morning. Those swimming parents that are here, I already know what you're doing. You're used to those 6 a.m. practices and those things. Those things could happen. And then what we do when we have to have a, a after 7 p.m. practice, we coordinate that. Uh, we, we, we move that around where it's not like that every week. So if those student athletes happen to have a class that's on an evening time when we have practice, they will be told to go to the class and they will be excused from practice that night. But please understand that we have very few evening classes at Austin College, and then we do not give a set evening time every week to our programs. We rotate them on a daily basis. We have never had any issues with class conflicts. As your student and most of them have already done their schedule for the fall, we make it very clear that from 8 a.m. in the morning until 4.30, they should not worry about any athletic requirements. Get in the classes that you need because none of our athletic practices will interfere with academic classes. Uh, so, so we will talk to them about that. That's not to say if your son or daughter isn't in season, that we have meetings, that we do things during the day, but that's only if they're not in an academic class. We are committed to your son and daughter having the best experience that they can, not only athletically, but institutionally. But our number one, our number one goal is at the end of four years or less that your son or daughter walks across the stage with a competitive degree and that they can look back on their athletic participation and see that it was a transformational experience. As you know, in athletics, and this is an old term that I use. Athletics, along with many other co-curricular opportunities, the band, uh, e-sports, those type of things, they really develop what I call the hidden curriculum. The importance of getting there early, the importance of not letting other people down, the importance of listening to people that want to help you get better, and the importance of not putting in extra work. You know, you don't get a lot of that in the classroom per se. They're going to learn so much. They're going to become so knowledgeable. But we do support their academics. And at the end of the day, anything that interferes with them, academics will take the priority over that. Um, 
one of the things that we will confirm next week, it's still out there by the NCAA, but I want to alert you to it now. Uh, we will know this on Tuesday, but the NCAA just put out a new requirement that all first year student athletes must provide documentation of a sickle cell test. We have been told that everyone that was born after a certain day, which your son or daughter ha has met that date, that all infants are given a sickle cell test when they are born. So we, we will get that information out, but if you have documentation of a sickle cell test, we ask that you look for that. You can do that through their birth records. If you can't find that, then you may need to take another sickle cell test, but we will be required to do that and have documentation of the results of that test. That is a new requirement by the NCAA. In the past, it's always been an option, but they have changed that on us in the last month. So we are looking through the options, but I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, again, all student athletes before they report to campus should have a copy, a hard copy or an electronic copy of their physical before they come to campus and should have and make available a copy, an electronic copy of their current insurance card, the front and the back. So I know that I've kind of gone through some things uh, and, and please know that we will go through each one of these things with your son or daughter uh, and we will make sure that they understand all of our policies, all of our procedures. So at this time, I Bailey, I will give you a chance to see if there are any specific questions that may pop up. Thank you, David. Excellent job there. Uh, a few questions that come in that I was able to respond to, uh, but there's one left in the question. Uh, what is the GPA a student has to maintain, I assume, to keep eligibility? Great question. Number one about eligibility, the number one thing is that students at all times must be enrolled in a full level of classes. At Austin College, that is three full credits. Uh, we do have some quarter credit classes. We have some half credit classes. But we tell our student athletes that before they drop a class, communicate with their coach so we can make sure if they drop a class, they will maintain an elig eligibility. If they drop below three credits, they automatically become ineligible. Now, to expand on that, the first semester, obviously, new students are eligible. After their first semester, they must have a 1.5 GPA to participate their second semester. At the conclusion of their second semester, which is the end of their first year, they must have a 1.7. At the conclusion of their third semester, which is the first semester typically of their sophomore year, they have to have a 1.8. From that point forward, after their third semester, they have to maintain a cumulative GPA of a 2.0. The GPAs are determined only by classes taken at Austin College. So if they fall below that eligibility standard, the only way they can become eligible is to take a course at Austin College that raises that. I'll be so proud to tell you that out of our roughly 150 new student athletes last year, our freshmen, after the first semester, we only had five student athletes that did not meet the GPA requirement of 1.5. And all, all of our student athletes that are returning to Austin College as a second year student, all of them last spring except one met their GPA requirement. So uh, I hope that that explained that, but basically first semester, those spring supports, you know, they're gonna have to have a 1.5 if they're a winter sport and they are involved in the middle of their season 
and they do not have a 1.5 their second semester, then they become ineligible. But they need to be at a 2.0 after their third semester, and that will remain until they graduate. We also have long answer, I know, no one's going to, we also have to meet satisfactory uh, uh, performance towards a degree, and we follow the Austin College policy as we do with financial aid. So we keep up with how many credits they must have, and we also keep up with their G GPA. Bailey, I, I apologize for that long answer. The parent that sent that in, I apologize for that, but I just want to be as thorough as I can. No problem. And just to clarify, we were going over their GPA earned while at Austin College. Yes. They start the first semester with with just having to be enrolled. So as long as they're in full time enrollment, they will be eligible to play our fall sports. That's true. Okay. That's true. Just clarifying that. Yes, uh, Thank you. The question came in about needing a TB test. Is TB required for athletics? It is required for Austin College in general. If it's required for Austin College, then it'll be required for athletics. So anything that's required for you to attend Austin College, that just falls into the athletic component. So uh, the TB test, yes, that, that you have to provide that, then that will cover that. We will not require that past the first year. Great. Um, from a budgeting perspective, how are meals handled while traveling for games? Okay, we have a per diem, obviously, it's, it's never enough, but when student athletes travel, we cover all of their meals, okay? We cover every meal that they're going to miss. If we, for some reason, and this will happen like in fall camp, your student athletes will, all of their meals will be paid for up until the day before classes start. We will have basketball tennis we will have breaks that we require student athletes to stay here we will never charge you more for them to stay in their dorm room and we will provide a per diem or we will provide their meals for them so we support our student athletes that have to be here outside of the normal open times of our cafeteria uh, so so we we uh we have a, a healthy per diem our coaches do everything they can. Our coaches are responsible for making sure that, that we do that. I, I don't want anyone to think that when we're on the road, we eat uh, we eat at steak every night. No, we, we, we eat a good meal. But also, please know that when we're getting ready to come home, we want to get the quickest meal we can. So a lot of times, that may be a Chick-fil-A box. That may be a pizza. That may be all of that. If a student athlete makes, a, makes us aware of dietary concerns or dietary issues, we, we do everything we can to accommodate that. And just to confirm, when, the, when our students get here, our dining halls open and we have um, breakfast hours, lunch hours, and dinner hours for all of our early arrivals. And yes. then the dining hall opens for continuous dining starting on uh, Friday of move-in day, that August 19th. And the other thing, Bailey, that I'll add there, yep. once th that is when the meal plan starts, okay? So most first-year students are on a meal plan. So that meal plan will start and get them through the first day of classes. Uh, and then if there's any student athlete that may not be on a meal plan, we will cover their cost of meals through Sunday evening. But then after that, the meals are on their own, just like they typically would be if they're going to class every day. But that usually doesn't come into effect with our new students because all of them are on meal plans, as I understand it. Right. Uh, the question, um, will the presence of a sickle cell trait prevent a student from participating in athletics? I, I, I'm going to talk to our uh, trainer about that. So I am going to tell you that the answer is no. Okay. What the sickle cell test does, it helps us identify anyone who may be in that situation where we can support them and be aware of the issues related to that. But a positive sickle cell test does not mean they cannot compete. Right. That was our final question. Give it just a minute more in case somebody's feverishly typing over there to get their question in. 
And then Bailey, I'm going to make one outreach. Sure. If, if any parents, you know, I know how this works. We hang up, you go, man, I wish you would have asked this. I wish you would have asked that. If it's something like that, and I will get back to you. A lot of times I don't get to my email until 10 o'clock at night. But if it's a question like that, feel free to email myself, David Norman. It's on the directory, dnorman at austincollege.edu. You know, hey, I was on the presentation the other night. We had this question. Or email your email the coach that you can find on our directory as well. Great. I, that was going to be my plug too. Oh, and someone oh. did. Um, what is the form the kids have to fill out for us to get sports and academic info? Let's see. Let's say they get hurt at a game. Are we going to get notification? Which hospital are they going to? Yeah, yeah. In terms of, of that, we, we listen, and, I, and we probably have attorneys on the call. We probably have doctors on the call. But at the end of the day, we, we are going to let parents know about that. So what we will do is each one of your parents will, I mean, each one of your sons or daughters and that, those compliance issues will fill out emergency contact. If you are on that emergency contact, then we will contact you to let you know, hey, we've taken your son or daughter to the hospital. Are we taking your son? You know what I'm saying? So, so they, if they give us an emergency contact, which they will fill out when they're there, then we do make sure that, that the parents are aware that even means if we have to take them to the hospital, I don't know, look, heat exhaustion, concussion, all of those things. We do tell student athletes, depending on, depending on the, 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 uh, the capacity that they're in, we will tell them, hey, we're here, call your parents and tell them what's going on. But if they are incapacitated, we will make sure that we get that information to you. But we do need that information on their emergency contact list. Uh, that, that, so, let me let me expand yeah. on that just sure. real quickly. You know, at the end of the day, what what the, where we get really sticky is if we're at a game, okay, your son or your daughter gets injured. We don't need the parents coming on the field or we don't need the parents charging us. What's wrong? What's wrong? You know what I'm saying? Let us do our job. We will meet with that student athlete uh, at that time. We will meet with uh, the student athlete after the fact, and you will be given the information that you need to know. But uh, if you happen, we will not invite a, a parent on the field. We will not invite a parent to come in and, while the doctor is evaluating them. But if you're there, we will let you know. It's a very anxious time, but at the end of the day, we're going to do everything I can we can to keep you informed, and we will let you know especially if it's important, like your son or daughter's in the hospital, your son or daughter has this type of injury. Great. Uh, it's come in um, a few times. So just to reiterate, uh, the pre-participation health physical form is available at acruse.com slash information slash training. And that that is a physical form that's specific for athletics, and it's different than the physical form that we've requested from the health packet. So both of those forms are required um, to get in. Uh, our, our health packet requires shot records. Are they sending shot records to the trainer as well? No, we do not. Okay. We, we just get the only thing that comes specifically to our athletic trainers and we will have them do this when they're here, is we do a pre-participation health history form that they fill out. They will be doing a test called the impact testing. That is for concussion awareness. We will do a BESS test, B-E-S-S, -S, where we evaluate all of their, uh, for lack of better terms, locomotor responses to things like balance and things like that, because if there's an issue there, that could be a sign of, of some type of, uh, I don't want to say mental, but some type of brain issue could even be a sign of concussion. But no, all of the other forms that they have to turn in for to, to enroll, they do that, but we do not, we just have access to those records. The only thing that we would say is if when your son or daughter gets their physical done on the Austin College Athletics physical form, submit that form to the uh, student life and to pre- and that form will go, but but things like but everything else they require you to do, you'll have to do those. 
Uh, I think th this says Quest Diagnostic requires a form from AC to do the blood test. So I think referring to the sickle cell. So if everybody needs to go retest for sickle cell, we might need a form that states why we're requiring it potentially, I think is the question. Well, well, the 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 the, the, the way it's been explained to me that if you can't find documentation of the um, of your sickle cell test result, how you obtain that is what you need to. So I assume that's a great question. I'll talk to our trainer about it tomorrow. We will have an answer by next Tuesday. But if someone says that they need confirmation of why it's required, we will develop a, a form or a letter where we can get that to the appropriate people so they can provide that to uh, their uh, quest or to the laboratory that they're working with. Okay. We do not have that in place yet, but I will speak with our trainer about that. Okay. And I have a few other people have said that their doctor, when they did a physical, has just done it. So it might be getting through the medical community that this is coming up for NCAA. And so. Um, yeah, it's just very frustrating because it was sprung on us so late. Yeah. Okay. You know? um, just, to, I'm going to, I'm going to do a share screen right quick at the request to show <laughs> you. <laughs> this pre-participation pre physical form is. Um, so acruse.com information training, and here's the pre-participation physical form link that then opens for you to download. And hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so that, that's the difference from that. So we have the history form and we have the examination form. The two pages. So, okay. And again, we understand there are a lot of forms that are coming your way. So, please, um, if you have questions, again, reach out um, to the athletics department. They're there to assist you. And uh, just to reiterate as well, those are the only two things that pre participation stuff that you said, that's all you need to fill out. All the other forms that may be listed, we will fill those out during our NCAA compliance. All right, I think that takes care of questions. That takes us also to the top of the hour, just past it. Thank you for everyone joining this evening. I know David is counting down the days to see your student athletes here. Everyone on campus is excited for this new class coming in. Uh, we are reachable uh, Monday through Thursday uh, for the next two weeks, and then we'll be back to full schedules Monday through Friday after the, uh, starting the second week of August. Y'all have a lovely evening and reach out if you have any further questions. Go Rams! Yeah.